Today's video is brought to you by Magic the Gathering's The Lord of the Rings Tales of Middle-Earth. The biggest magic release of all time featuring iconic characters, stories, and settings from the greatest fantasy world of all time. Join the fellowship and dive into The Lord of the Rings Tales of Middle-Earth on sale June 23rd. It is arguably the most iconic scene in The Lord of the Rings. And while on its surface it seems like a match between an old wizard and a monster of shadow and flame, the true meaning and nature of this conflict runs deep in the lore of Tolkien's world. Today on Nerd of the Rings, we look at Gandalf's confrontation with the Balrog, the words he uses in his rebuke, and the deeper meaning within. Now we'll take a look at Gandalf's speech a phrase at a time. But let's take a look at the text itself to remind us the words Gandalf uses. The Balrog reached the bridge. Gandalf stood in the middle of the span, leaning on the staff in his left hand. But in his other hand, Glamdring gleamed, cold and white. His enemy halted again, facing him, and the shadow about it reached out like two vast wings. It raised the whip, and the thongs whined and cracked. Fire came from its nostrils, but Gandalf stood firm. You cannot pass, he said. The orc stood still, and a dead silence fell. I am a servant of the secret fire, wielder of the flame of Arnor. You cannot pass. The dark fire will not avail you, flame of Uldun. Go back to the shadow. You cannot pass. First we have, I am a servant of the secret fire. Naturally, the question is, what is the secret fire? For that answer, we must go to the very beginning of the Silmarillion. In the Ainulindale, we learn how the Ainur, that is the Valar and Maiar, took part in a great song, and Eru, the god of Tolkien's world, gave these thoughts the secret fire, which burns at the heart of the world. It is summarized in the second chapter of the Silmarillion as follows. In the beginning, Eru, the one, who in the elvish tongue is named Iluvatar, made the Ainur of his thought, and they made a great music before him. In this music the world was begun, for Iluvatar made visible the song of the Ainur, and they beheld it as a light in the darkness, and many among them became enamored of its beauty, and of its history which they saw beginning and unfolding as in a vision. Therefore Iluvatar gave to their vision being, and set it amid the void, and the secret fire was sent to burn at the heart of the world, and it was called Ea. This secret fire is quite simply what gives true life to any creation. We find it also goes by another name in Tolkien's text, the flame imperishable. For when Eru instructs the Ainur to devise the world in their song, he says, And since I have kindled you with the flame imperishable, ye shall show forth your powers in adorning this theme each with his own thoughts and devices, if he will. While Eru gives living things this flame imperishable, allowing them independent thought and will, created beings cannot wield this flame, meaning only Eru himself can give true life. We see an example of this when the Vala Aule creates the dwarves. Initially, they are incapable of doing anything without Aule being present and willing their actions into being. It's only after Iluvatar gives them the flame imperishable that they're capable of independent thought and action, creating the dwarves as we would come to know them. Even the most powerful of the Valar, the Dark Lord Morgoth, did not have this power, which is why he had to take other creatures, like Iluvatar's elves, to twist into his orcs. As such, it is fitting that Gandalf refers to himself as a servant of the secret fire. It is a way of saying that he serves above all others the one, Eru Luvatar, the only one who can wield the flame imperishable. It's worth noting here that while most, if not all, the Fellowship would have no idea what Gandalf is referring to here, the Balrog would know exactly what Gandalf is talking about. Because like Gandalf himself, the Balrog is a Maya, and was present at, and took part in, the music of the Ainur. Both of these beings, now facing off thousands upon thousands of years later, were present at the very creation of the world, when Eru used the secret fire. And what Gandalf is pointing out here is that while the Balrog has long ago abandoned following the will of Eru, 
and fell into the service of the Dark Lord Morgoth, Gandalf has remained true to his purpose and still serves Eru and the Secret Fire. In Gandalf's second phrase, he refers to himself as wielder of the Flame of Anor. Now there are a couple prevailing theories regarding what the Flame of Anor might be. First, we'll begin with what I personally think is the least likely, a Ring of Power. While it isn't revealed in the book until Frodo's arrival at the Grey Havens, Gandalf, for all his time in Middle-earth, possesses Narya, one of the three elven rings of power. In the Silmarillion, we learn that Círdan the Shipwright gives Gandalf the ring when he first arrives in Middle-earth. Take now this ring, he said, for thy labors and thy cares will be heavy, but in all it will support thee and defend thee from weariness, for this is the ring of fire, and herewith, maybe, thou shalt rekindle hearts to the valor of old in a world that grows chill." This has led many to believe that Gandalf is making a direct reference to the fact that he wields Narya, the Ring of Fire. Indeed, many of Gandalf's acts involve using fire. Just a bit earlier in the story, we saw Gandalf set fire to one of Legolas's arrows mid-flight during the Warg attack. So Gandalf's abilities, and his ring, seem like a pretty natural fit. However, it's worth noting that the elven ring bearers are generally very secretive about the fact that they possess them. It's only late in Frodo's conversation with Galadriel that he is able to perceive that she likewise possesses a ring of power. But perhaps the biggest bit of evidence that the Flame of Anor is not referring to Gandalf's ring comes down to real world timing. It turns out Tolkien had written this passage of Gandalf's standoff with the Balrog before he decided to give Gandalf a ring of power. In the History of Middle-earth Part 7, The Treason of Isengard, Christopher Tolkien notes that in the earlier version of the tale, Elrond had confirmed that the Three Rings were taken over the sea and are no longer in Middle-earth. Also in some earlier drafts, we see Tolkien contrast Gandalf's fire with the flame of the Balrog. You cannot pass, he said. Go back, I am the master of the white fire. The red flame cannot come this way. The creature made no reply, but standing up tall so that it loomed above the wizard, it strode forward and smote him. A sheet of white flame sprang before him like a shield, and the Balrog fell backward, its sword shivered. Here it's apparent that Gandalf is speaking of a power that we immediately afterwards see in use as his white fire blocks the Balrog with a shield-like flame. Now we'll get to what Gandalf calls the Balrog in contrast to himself in just a bit, but the final clue to the meaning of Flame of Anor is the word Anor itself. Anor is a Sindarin word, meaning sun. This likely means that the light Gandalf wields is like that of the sun, the sun itself deriving from an untarnished fruit of one of the two trees. And there's good reason that this would be relevant to the Balrog, for we read in the Silmarillion that Morgoth passed his feelings about the sun on to his servants. But Morgoth hated the new lights and was for a while confounded by this unlooked for stroke of the Valar. And Arian, that is the Maya who guides the sun, Morgoth feared with a great fear, but dared not come nigh her. With shadows he hid himself and his servants from Arian, the glance of whose eyes they could not long endure, and the lands near his dwelling were shrouded in fumes and great clouds. And it is this good and pure light, a hatred of which Morgoth passes on to his servants, that would contrast so well with the Balrog himself. Before telling the Balrog to go back to the shadow, Gandalf informs the demon, the dark fire will not avail you, flame of Udun. First, we'll briefly touch on the Dark Fire. We've had a lot of talk of flame and fire and how they relate to Gandalf, but let's not forget the Balrog itself is a demon of not just shadow, but also flame. Here we see Gandalf giving us a contrast between his own fire, the Flame of Anor, and that of the Balrog, the Dark Fire, what we can think of as the evil fire. Here he's telling the Balrog that his Dark Flame will not help him because Gandalf himself is a servant of the secret fire and wielder of the Flame of Anor. Then he calls the Balrog by a name, Flame of Udun. And full disclosure, when I first came to the Lord of the Rings through the Peter Jackson films, I totally thought this was some kind of incantation Gandalf was yelling in preparation for the Balrog strike. However, we find that he is referring to the Balrog directly as Flame of Udun. 
To find the meaning of Udun, we turn to the earliest days of the world, as we have with so much of this clash between these ancient beings. We learn that Udun is a less commonly used Sindarin name of Utumno, Morgoth's first fortress in the newly created world. The lands of the far north were all made desolate in those days, for there Utumno was delved exceeding deep and its pits were filled with fires and with great hosts of the servants of Melkor. This fortress would have been where the Balrogs, and indeed this Balrog himself, would have come under the service of Morgoth, where this once great angelic being like Gandalf himself became twisted into a demon of shadow and flame. We look at the term Flame of Udun, knowing it not only as the location from whence the Balrog came, but also its meaning for Utumno and Udun are translated into Dark Pit, Underworld, or Hell. Finally, Gandalf says for the third time, you cannot pass. On its surface, this is quite straightforward. Gandalf will not allow the Balrog to pass out of Moria. It's quite understandable considering the destruction such a creature could bring, not to mention the terror it would inflict should it ally with Sauron. However, in that earlier version of the text that Christopher Tolkien gave us in the History of Middle-earth, we see a line that Christopher says was probably immediately struck out. It is forbidden for any Balrog to come beneath the sky since Fionwë, son of Manwë, overthrew Thangorodrim. Now, this is obviously a very early version of Tolkien's Legendarium and not what is in the final text by any means. We see that rather than Aonwe, the herald of Manwe, this character is still conceptualized as Fionwe, son of Manwe, and that it was he who overthrew Thangorodrim. But it's interesting to me that even if only for a fleeting moment, Tolkien considered the option that the Balrog could not leave Moria, for it was forbidden. Which begs the question that, if this had been the version Tolkien had gone with, what would have happened if the Balrog indeed stepped out into the sunlight? Now that we know about the secret fire, the flame of Anor, and the flame of Udun, let's take another look at the great confrontation on the bridge of Khazad-dûm. You cannot pass, he said. The orc stood still, and a dead silence fell. I am a servant of the secret fire, wielder of the flame of Anor. You cannot pass. The dark fire will not avail you, flame of Udun. Go back to the shadow. You cannot pass. The Balrog made no answer. The fire in it seemed to die, but the darkness grew. It stepped forward slowly onto the bridge, and suddenly it drew itself up to a great height, and its wings were spread from wall to wall. But still Gandalf could be seen, glimmering in the gloom. He seemed small and altogether alone, gray and bent, like a wizened tree before the onset of a storm. From out of the shadow, a red sword leaped flaming. Glamdring glittered white in answer. There was a ringing clash and a stab of white fire. The Balrog fell back and its sword flew up in molten fragments. The wizard swayed on the bridge, stepped back a pace, and then again stood still. You cannot pass, he said. With a bound, the Balrog leaped full on the bridge. Its whip whirled and hissed. At that moment, Gandalf lifted his staff and crying aloud, he smote the bridge before him. The staff broke asunder and fell from his hand. A blinding sheet of white flame sprang up. The bridge cracked. Right at the Balrog's feet, it broke, and the stone upon which it stood crashed into the gulf, while the rest remained, poised, quivering like a tongue of rock thrust out into emptiness. With a terrible cry, the Balrog fell forward, and its shadow plunged down and vanished. But even as it fell, it swung its whip and the throngs lashed and curled about the wizard's knees, dragging him to the brink. He staggered and fell, grasped vainly at the stone, and slid into the abyss. Fly, you fools, he cried, and was gone. Gandalf's confrontation with the Balrog is one of incredible depth and deeper meaning in the history of Middle-earth. And I have to say, it's one of the many things that make me so grateful for the work of Christopher Tolkien. Without him, we wouldn't have a clue of the incredible deeper meaning of this dramatic event. It's truly a clash of epic proportions, with great immortal beings who have been on opposite sides, wielding their respective flames of light and darkness since the earliest days of the world.
It never fails any time I talk, read, or think about Middle-earth, I'm left wanting more. And with the upcoming release of Magic the Gathering's The Lord of the Rings Tales of Middle-earth, we've got a new way to experience Tolkien's world. Whether you're a seasoned Magic player or a newbie like me, there's tons of fun to be had in this super fun card game. Or if you're one who likes to collect cards, also like me, there's a lot of really great cards, full of book characters, locations, and relics. Not to mention alternate versions with iconic artwork from the Brothers Hildebrandt and the Ralph Bakshi film. The Lord of the Rings Tales of Middle-earth goes on sale June 23rd. Check out the link in the description to learn more and order packs of The Lord of the Rings Tales of Middle-earth. And be sure to tune in next week when I host a Learn to Play stream here on Nerd of the Rings. As always, I want to say a huge thank you to my Patreon supporters who make this channel possible. Tom DeBombadil19, Listen Me the Cinda, Kella Brimbor, The Mighty Mim, Team Weasel, Rabbi Rob Thomas, Charles Leisure, Toby Mobs Music, CCDC Red Team, Nerd Sigman Anytimer, Pelkey Sports Cards, Mookie the Brown, Christopher Carbaugh, Joe Tepper, Sky Carcass, Slide Belts, Dane Ragnarsson, Salim Rahman, Zetrock, Berto Berg, Grand Strategy Nerd, Graham Derricott, The Dark Haired One, Wyland, Michael Wu, Grant McGregor, and Debbie. If you enjoyed the artwork in this video, check out the artists in the description and purchase prints of their great work for yourself. Thanks so much for watching and subscribing, and we'll see you next time on Nerd of the Rings.